Psalm 103. I'm going to read the first four, five verses of this psalm together. David writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Then he begins to name these benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Blessing the Lord. If I had a title for the message, it would be that. Blessing the Lord. To bless the Lord. David writes, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. David here sought to bring his whole being, his whole soul, and all that is within him to bless the Lord. He says it even twice in verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O my soul. The question then is, what is it to bless the Lord? How can we who are sinners, who depend totally upon God, surely we can be blessed of God, seeing He can add much to us. But how can we who are His creatures, bless God. Bless God. The secret is, the key is, the understanding this word bless, it means to kneel. That is the root word here in the original, is to kneel, to bow down, to worship, to praise, to give thanks. So David is saying, Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord. Worship the Lord. Honor the Lord. With what? All that I have. All my soul. All my heart. All my will. All my desire. Let everything that is within me bless Him. Praise Him. Worship Him. Psalm 95, it says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Now that is how we worship God. You cannot worship God standing. You must be bowing to worship God. God must cause a man before he's ever going to bless the Lord, he must cause him to kneel, to bow. Let us kneel before our the Lord, our maker. So blessing God is not adding anything to God. When we bless him, When we praise Him, we are only giving to God what is rightfully His. What is His by just desert. He is worthy of all praise. I read, you you don't think that that's... Well, preacher, that's that's just right. We we understand that. Not everybody understands that. I read read a man one time, he said, to bless the Lord means you need to get out there and save souls. You need to add to God. That man has no clue who God is. No clue who God is. We cannot add anything to perfection. Cannot add anything to his joy. He is fully happy. And nothing we do adds to him at all. He is the great I am. We worship him and bow because he is worthy of all blessing. In Revelation 4, 11, it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor, and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they were created. And listen to this, only saints can bless him. Only those who know him can bless him. Only saints can bless him from the soul. 
Religion tries to bless God. They try to worship God in their vain attempts of outward religion. They put on their shows and their pomp and their ceremony and their, their uh, beautiful structures and their beautiful robes and all of the sights and the sounds that appeal to the flesh. And they say that is worship. Yet God said, they worship me with their heart, with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You can't worship God except it come from the heart. David said, bless the Lord, O oh my what soul. You, it comes from the heart to worship God. And if a man is not saved, does not know God by divine revelation, he cannot bless God. It's impossible. Try as he may, he can't. Only believers are able to do this. Only those who are quickened by the power of the Holy Spirit to the new birth, who are given a new nature, who believe solely on the Lord Jesus Christ is all their hope, they alone are able to bless and praise the Lord. In fact, only those who are in Christ, their blessings alone are received of God. Their blessings alone. Therefore, you believer, you may bless the Lord because you are indeed dead unto sin. <laughs> you may approach unto God because Christ has removed your sin. He has given you His holy nature and therefore you may bless the Lord with all your soul and be accepted. Paul said, likewise reckon yourselves indeed to be dead to sin but alive unto God. How? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. Only through Him. Only through faith in Him. And secondly, not only to bless the Lord, what do we bless? His holy name. We bless His holy name. When you think of a name, what do you think of? Character. This is what it's talking about when it says the name of the Lord. It's talking about His attributes. Bless the Lord through the knowledge of his attributes. In other words, when I, when I say a name of a person, automatically you associate that name with a character, with, with some attributes concerning the person. If I were to say Adolf Hitler, well, there's some character that there. There's, when I say his name, his character, his evil character comes to mind. When I say the Apostle Paul, you, there's character that comes to mind. His, his, uh, his love for God, his love for Christ, his conversion, those characteristics come to mind. When I say the name Jehovah, there should be characteristics of Jehovah, attributes of Jehovah that come to mind by which we bless him. And we bless him from our innermost being concerning his character we bless Him because He is great. Isn't Jehovah great? He is great because He is the only God. The only true and living God. Asaph said this, In Judah God is known, His name is great in Israel. His name is exalted. Isaiah said that his people make mention of his, and his name is exalted. His name is holy. He is the only holy God, righteous and true. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. He is sovereign. Our God is in the heavens and hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Our God is eternal. Our God is immutable. These characteristics, we may dwell upon them, take each one of them and contemplate the greatness of His name, that there is none like Him, that He is altogether by Himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, He is the only Savior. There is no other Savior but God. 
Jehovah is a covenant God. Isn't that something that brings it to mind? And we're going to talk about these benefits. These benefits that he's going to show us are concerning a covenant that he made with himself, concerning us, his children. These things should cause us to bless his name, for he is great and holy and powerful, omnipotent, immutable. And listen, we should bless his name because it's dreadful among the heathen. His name is dreadful. Why do you suppose men don't want to come and hear the gospel? They don't want to hear of their sin. You know, our Lord Jesus said, if I had not come, they had not sinned. Now, they had sinned, they just didn't know it until they got there, until he revealed it to them. Men don't want, he's dreadful. He's a God of justice, a God of wrath, and a God of love. These things. And so by these characteristics, God is worthy of all blessing, of all His creatures, that every one of us here should bow down and worship Him. Bow down and worship Him. But no one will unless God reveals Himself to them. Now everybody should. Everyone should bow. But unless God reveals himself to man, they will not bow. They will not bow unless he reveals his mercy and mercy and gives them faith in Christ. How can you bless God outwardly by religious lip service? But only those who experience the grace of God in regeneration shall kneel before God and bless him. Now the benefits of wicked sinners is not that it instills comfort, but fear. Those who do not know God. The wicked, he says in Isaiah 3, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him. Now hear this. If you're without Christ this morning, I want you to understand what God says about you. It is ill with you. It is very bad with you. It is ill. It is not good. For reward, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. This is why it's ill, because God will judge you and give you a just reward for all your sins. That's why it's ill. You see, salvation is not knowing Calvinism. There's a lot of people confused about that. People think that they they know doctrine in their head, that somehow they can... They can worship God. No, it's not just knowing doctrine or creeds of a church. What is it? It's to know Christ. If you don't know Christ, God says it is ill with you. It is not well with you. Have you surrendered to Christ? Listen, those who bless the Lord, we kneel. We surrender. If you've not surrendered to Christ, it's ill with you. I, it brings to mind when I think of surrender, I think of that, uh, the, some of those uh, portraits in, in uh, uh, the Appomattox house, how the South surrendered. In one of those photos, it shows a line of, of weapons stacked. Just rows and rows of these arms that are stacked. When they surrendered, it was an unconditional surrender. They surrendered their weapons and their flags. Have you surrendered your weapons? And bowed before God. What are your weapons? Your works. You know, your works are not for God, they're against God. If a man take Christ and try to apply his work to Christ, he is against God. He is against the gospel of God's grace. He is still fighting, he has not surrendered. You must fall down. In absolute, in seeking absolute mercy. You cannot obligate God to show mercy. You must come as the leper came. Lord, if you will. Peradventure. Peradventure. That's how a sinner comes, isn't it? Hope against hope that he might show me mercy. And if 
a man is trying to work some kind of deal and demand mercy, that's not surrender. That's not surrender. If you've never repented of your dead works, you've never known the benefits of God's blessings. But all that come to God trying to merit His favor, it is ill. But there's, a, there's something good here. If God, by His mercy, gives you repentance, causes you to surrender, and you do come for mercy, I want you to know this, it's well with you. God says this to His children, to all who believe on Christ, it is well. Say you to the righteous, it shall be what? Well. It shall be well with Him. Audrey, Audrey, would you get the door, please? Thank you. Now, those who have come to Christ by faith, what have we found? We have found mercy. We have found mercy. Every one of us who have come to Christ, we have found mercy. Now, this term merciful was first used concerning Lot. Lot was the first time that the word merciful was used in Scripture. Listen to this. While he lingered in Sodom, the men laid hold upon him and his wife and upon his daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. Now, did Lot deserve deliverance? You know, he lingered just like his wife and children. There was no difference between him and his wife who found out that her, she had no belief at all. She went back. She turned back. Her heart was still there. But Lot found mercy. And listen, I didn't deserve mercy either. And neither did you. Friends, if we deserve mercy, guess what? It's not mercy. It's not mercy. All of God's people need mercy, and all that come to God by Jesus Christ find mercy. Find mercy. The Lord is gracious, listen, and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. Now, so let us, with David this morning, seek to bless the Lord. We who believe in Christ, we are able to bless the Lord. Let us, by grace, bless the Lord. Worship the Lord. Worship the God of mercy, the God of grace, the eternal, boundless compassion of God who has brought us to faith in Christ. Now, I've got six things here, six benefits. In these, chap these, these little verses here, six benefits by which we may be able to bless the Lord. These are, these are things that move the soul of the believer to bless Him. These are the things, the benefits, move us to bless God. First thing is this, forgiveness of sins. Look at that in your text. Verse 3, Bless the Lord who forgiveth all thine sins iniquities now we have heard these things time and time again these things I'm mentioning to you we've heard them time and time again haven't we but we're like Israel the scripture says this Israel forgot God their savior when he had done these great things in Egypt these Egyptians after God had delivered Israel Guess what? They forgot. How can you forget the parting of the Red Sea? Do you suppose that you would forget that? Do you suppose you'd forget that great power and deliverance of the blood of Lamb, the Lamb that caused Him to drive you out? And yet they did. And it didn't take years. It took just a few days, and they had already forgot. We too are so prone to forget these things. We become dull of hearing because of the things of the world creep in on us. We forget these benefits. We're like a leaky bowl. How much do you suppose you're going to remember this when you get out the door? And that which you retain, how long will you remember that? It leaks out. 
You know what you need to keep a leaky bowl full? You need a constant flow of water. That's what the preaching of the gospel is. That's what the reading of the word is. It's a constant pouring out to fill us, to remind us of these benefits. Therefore, God says it twice. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Why? They need it twice. They don't need it just once. They need it again. Lord, don't repeat himself just to repeat himself. It's showing us that we need to perpetually give you these comforts. And Paul said to his brethren, Indeed, it's not grievous for me to say these things, same things to you, but it's needful for you. It's needful. It is safe for you that I preach these same things. And listen, this is the first one. Forgiveth thine iniquities. This is the first one because without it we could have no other blessings. We could not bless the Lord unless we know our sin is forgiven. Remember what separated us from God is what? Sin. And unless we know that sin has been removed, we cannot bless God. We cannot approach God. We cannot worship God. God demands payment for sin at the hand of the sinner. Without satisfaction of God's justice, none of us could freely come before Him. But God in mercy purposed to forgive even before there was sin. This is good news. He purposed to forgive you even before there was any sin. In the election of grace, God willed to forgive you. Purposed to forgive you. You know what? God is not like us. When someone offends us, we weigh this out, don't we? We weigh it out. We have to, are they really seeking our forgiveness or do we need, you know, so we weigh our forgiveness out like that based on, because it's contingent, isn't it? Contingent upon the other person or upon how we feel at the moment. God is no such way as like that. God's forgiveness is not contingent upon the sinner, but his own desire and will to forgive. In the election of grace, God willed to forgive out of love and thus provided a lamb for us before the foundation of of the world. Jesus is said to be as a lamb slain when? From before the foundation of the world. Now I want you to notice that every one of these benefits that I'm talking about are all present perfect tense. He forgiveth, E-T-H, all thine iniquities. He healeth all thy diseases. He redeemeth thy life from destruction. Crowneth thee. Satisfieth thee. Present perfect tense. That means that he did it, he is doing it, and he shall forever do it. So, listen, in this matter of forgiveness, God has forgiven you. God is now forgiving you. And God shall forever forgive you. Is that a benefit? Is that not a benefit? It is to the sinner. It is to the one who needs forgiveness. How do I know that he will forgive me? Because God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How then shall he not with him freely give, all, give, us, uh, give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. What does justified mean? It means innocent. That's what it means. God said they're innocent. Now, if God said they're innocent, guess what? They're innocent. God's elect are innocent of sin. There is no sin. This is how it is to speak comfortably to believers, to Israel. Believer, all your sins are forgiven. All that you lack to fulfill the perfection of God has been provided and accomplished for you. 
All of us have broken the law of God, but God restored what He did not break. Therefore, none can lay anything to the charge of God's elect, not Satan, not the world, and listen to this one, not even yourself. Not even yourself. Bless the Lord, O my soul. He forgiveth all my iniquities. He has cast them into the depths of His eternal forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath He removed our transgressions from us. Therefore, Jesus said to that man that came, He lowered down, was sick of the palsy. He said, Son, be of good cheer. Why? Thy sins be forgiven. All who come to Christ have this blessing. All our sins. Secondly, he says this, who healeth all thy diseases. Not all our physical sicknesses, but rather the spiritual diseases. Believers get sick. Believers die physically. But truly, our disease is much worse than physical diseases. It is a spiritual malady. Spiritual disease. It's pictured many ways. Blindness, lameness, uh, death. That, that's a picture of our nature. But I think the, the most vivid picture is leprosy, isn't it? That, that disease that rots the flesh off of the bone. That's a good picture of us. Isaiah said we are full of wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. Unclean. In Leviticus chapter 13, God deals with leprosy as a type of sin. And found that with leprosy, when it is pronounced by the priest to be unclean, this person is cast out. This person is, a, is stripped. He's taken all of his possessions away. They strip him of his clothes. They shave his head. They give him rags. And they throw him out from the worship of God. What a great picture of what sin has done for us. The leprosy of sin. We by nature are pronounced unclean. We were born dead in trespasses and sins, cast out from the worship of God. We could not bless God. You know, in that chapter, there are four distinct marks of a true leper. In other words, for it to be leprosy, it had to be deeper than the skin. It couldn't be just a scratch on the skin. It had to be down in the skin. The second one is that the hair had to be white, dead from the root. The third thing is that it uh, had to spread. In other words, if it was contained, it wasn't leprosy. And the fourth thing is it had to be painful. It was very painful. It had to have all of those four marks to be leprosy. So it is true with spiritual leprosy. Sin has to be deeper than the skin. It has to be deeper. If you can... If you can be saved by what you by changing outward morality, it's not sin. It's, you're not a leper. Listen, if it isn't dead from the root, if you're not dead from the root, you're not a leper. And listen, if you can contain your sin, you're not a leper. And listen, if sin is not painful, you're not a real sinner. See, I only have good news for lepers. <laughs> you see, my sin is much deeper than the skin. Matter of fact, I am dead from the, from the very core of my being. I am dead. I know this. I can't contain my sin. It is spread throughout my whole being. And I know this sin is painful to my soul. But I've got good news for lepers. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Jesus Christ came into the world to save lepers. Sinners. True sinners. And it's only at the surrender of Christ may we experience the healing power of His grace. Now thirdly, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Remember our plight, believer. We were dead in sins. We hung over the, the pits of hell under the justice of the law. 
We were in the slave market of sin, waiting for the judgment and condemnation. But God, in Christ, hath redeemed thy life. He said, He redeemeth thy life. Remember I told you last week, two weeks ago, redemption has two parts, ransom and deliverance. In order to be redeemed, you must first be ransomed and then, secondly, delivered. Delivered. This ransom price is the price of our redemption from the justice of God, from the curse of the law. And the only price that was acceptable was the precious blood of the Son of God. There is no other price. There's no other price you could pay. This is the only price God demands. It's the only price God provides. And it's the only one God accepts. If you're trying to pay for redemption, if you're trying to earn redemption, isn't this what religion teaches? Religion teaches you can earn redemption. If you just turn your life around, if you just do this, if you just do that, you can redeem yourself. No, you can't. God won't accept it. It's not worth anything. The only thing that's worth anything to God in redemption is the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son. That's it. There is no other redemption. Paul said we were not bought with the price, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot, without blemish. This redemption price, the blood of the Son, He did this by taking our sins into His own body. The Father made Him to be sin. He bore our sins in His own body on the tree. Friends, we're not getting away with anything, are we? No. All of our sins who are in Christ have been fully paid for, not by us, but by our Redeemer. He paid the ransom price, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God. And not only did He ransom us, He delivered us. What's a deliverance? It is the, re, it's the new birth. That's the deliverance. When the Holy Spirit comes in power and gives us life, gives us a heart to believe, to trust in Christ, that is the deliverance. Is faith in the Son of God. That is something man cannot produce. Now, just speaking to you, have you been redeemed? You see Christ as all your redemption and you kneel and surrender before Him, yes, He's redeemed you. All who surrender are redeemed. Therefore, believer, is there anyone to condemn you? No. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, is risen again, who is at the right hand of God, ever living to make intercession for... See, not only did He redeem me, He's still redeeming me. He's still doing it. He sits at the, the right hand of the Father, constantly pleading His wounds. When you sin, what happens? Father, see these? <laughs> oh, yes, I see them. He's redeemed. He's redeemed. Believer, then, bless the Lord, for He has not just redeemed you to be His slave, but to be His Son. Is this not marvelous? I can understand Him redeeming me to be a slave. Now what the prodigal thought? Father, just make me one of Thine hired servants. Is that what the Father did? No. He ran and fell on His neck. This brings us to the next one. He crowneth thee with what? Loving kindness and tender mercies. Bless the Lord, for He crowns His sons. He has made us heirs and joint heirs with Christ. And what does a son of a king get? He gets a crown. And what is our crown? 
Our crown is not made of earthly gold or silver. Our crown is made of the loving kindness and tender mercies of our God. That is the crown of us. Crown of righteousness. Crown of peace. Here in His love, God, John said, here in His our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, so are we in this present world. Now, why does God look upon you with kindness? Because you are in union with His Son. That's why God sees you in loving kindness, because you are in union with His Holy Son. And so as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear Him. He is the Father of tender mercies. Believers, we are sons of God. Heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Therefore, He crowns us as kings and priests unto God and pours out daily His loving kindness. Don't you know this, that God is doing all things for your good? All things. Do you doubt that? Many times we doubt that God is doing us good. That's why God said this. I know my thoughts towards you. <laughs> Stop trying to tell me what I think about you. I know my thoughts towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. I will do them good all the days of their life. And this fifth thing, he says, He satisfieth thy mouth with good things. What is this feast that God sets before us that satisfies our mouth? It is the Word of God. This is the thing that satisfies our mouth. When John was before the angel and he had the book given to him, he, he said, give me the little book. And he said, here, take it and eat it. It will be bitter to thy belly but sweet to thy mouth. And what did John find? He ate the book and he said, it was sweet to my mouth, sweet to my taste, but bitter to to my belly. The Word of God that reveals these things of forgiveness and redemption and mercy and the blood of Christ and the resurrection are sweet to the taste. Sweet. Are they not sweet to us? Jeremiah said, Thy words I found and did eat them and they were to me joy and rejoicing in my heart. What is this bitterness? The bitterness is because of the remaining flesh, the old nature that still abides in every one of us, which makes us weary, this bitter to our belly. Why? Because we long to be righteous and cannot. We long to see the face of Christ and cannot. It's warfare that causes us to be weary and fall into sin and so many times we are overwhelmed with sin and guilt and fear what then causes us strength the same thing that was sweet to our taste also gives us renewal strength and that's the last thing he said he will restore so that thy youth is restored like the eagles. Are you weary? Are you weary? We get weary. Do you weep because of your sin and feel the corruption of your own heart, the unbelief of your own soul? Then let us say with David, Bless the Lord, O my soul. Command your soul to bless the Lord and forget not all His benefits. This is how we may do it. Don't forget the benefits. Forgiveness of sins, healing of our souls and hearts, the blood of Christ and His redemption. Remember His loving kindness as our, as our Father. Remember the Word that He gave us to eat and only by the Word is our strength renewed. Only by the Gospel that was sweet to our taste. Yes, this world is bitter. This world is bitter. Our sins and this rotting corpse drags us to the earth. 
But what's going to restore our soul? Forget not all his benefits. Don't forget. And if we're able not to forget, what can we do? We can bless the Lord. We can praise Him. We can bow before Him because of all of His wonderful benefits. I pray God will bless this to your hearts.